I, my, my wife's uh, car to change the time requires 17 steps, <laughs> 13 steps, 13 steps. And every time I try and uh, change the time when we went on daylight savings time, at a stoplight, I never made it through all 13 steps. And I woke up this morning realizing I don't have to because now we're back on daylight savings time. So I'm calling us National Daylight Savings Time or Procrastination Day. That is even better. So tonight we're going to learn about our guests, their work, uh, evaluate some of the initiatives that uh, they've discovered to mitigate saving our planet. and. Um, also make some recommendations for things we can do. And finally, why uh, we have reason to be optimistic. So I'm going to save that at the end so you don't run off to the Oscars or some other meaningless activity. And uh, Steve, I'm going to ask you to kick things off for us. When did you decide that you wanted to do something about saving the planet? Um. So there's there's two answers to that. The you know the first answer is so many years ago that I don't remember um, that it's, you know I don't remember what I read or saw that you know but it just kind of impinged on me that this is you know really important problem and you know a lot of you know maybe I you know, I should be trying to help do something about it but um, but then I, you know, I told myself you know I I was raising two young kids I was building a startup and and just didn't have time to engage um, and the kids are now grown and out of the house. And long story short, the startup is also grown and, and literally out of the house. And um, about a year ago, I found myself with more time. And, and you know, I'd always told myself someday I would, you know, try to make a contribution. And I'd realize someday it had, had arrived. So, yeah. Uh, and tell us about what you've been doing now that you said you want to make a contribution. Yeah. So the, 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 the short and boring answer is blogging. Um, so you know, I've been doing just a lot of reading and podcast consuming, which someone really needs to make a verb for, um, to just try to wrap my head around, you know, what is the state of the game? What's going on? You know, what's working? What's not working? Are we in trouble? What can we do about it? And um, I found myself blogging about that just to have an outlet for everything I'm learning. But, you know, I, I think what I would describe myself as I'm, I've been trying to wrap just yeah, wrap my head around the problem and find the the levers for change. And you know, I think I'm working toward getting involved in some more specific fashion. Um, I still don't know what that is, but I found just this process of trying to untangle, you know, there's so much confusing information out there. And just the process of trying to untangle that a little bit just for myself, but share it as I go. Um, some people have found interesting and and you know, I found to be uh, enjoyable. Um uh... I understand that you are an advisor to the chair of the Democratic Committee, and I wrote it down, but I don't have it in front of me. Do you remember the official title? Um, some of the words in there are climate crisis and committee. Uh, I'm not sure I could put them in order. Close enough. Close enough. Uh, they do they do great work, and uh, and we're very proud to have uh, an Ann Arbor. Resident is the chair of that, Michelle Dietrich. So if you're out there, Michelle, and I have reason to believe you are, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike, when did you, uh, when did it dawn on you that this is something that you were passionate about? Well, I when I was at Pioneer, I remember I had um, the gym, the football coach was my math teacher. And then I also had an ecology class and they were back to back. And it was when Pioneer was trying to expand their athletic facilities. And you had, and I literally had like the football coach saying how critical this was in class. We needed space. There were so many students who needed access. And then the ecology teacher saying how terrible this was because they were going to eat up, you know, a lot of the natural areas by Pioneer. And this was terrible. And so like, that was a really fun back-to-back uh, -back <laughs> education and competing interests uh, that sort of reinforce a lot of my feelings about uh, the environment and sustainability of time. So that's the most like distinct early memory I have um, uh, and stuck with it really from that point forward. And you got an earlier start than Steve. Uh, what'd, you, what'd you study at the university? 
Yeah, I was in, I, I studied environmental policy at U of M when it was still SNRE. Um, I left after that for DC, where mostly I was working for the Sierra Club, uh, the environmental group for five years, part of their political and lobbying team there. Um, came back to Ann Arbor and did my MBA at Ross School. Um, and then since then, I've been doing various startups and companies who have some private sector focus on issues related to sustainability. You made us very proud at the Sierra Club. You are the first, and as far as I know, the only member of the family, and I've done genealogical research, who was a union president. So you want to tell us about that? Yeah, well, it turns out, well, part of why I actually left to get an MBA was I was really tired of seeing corporations kick the environmental group's butts, but also just like how poorly run <laughs> the Sierra Club was, and not uniquely amongst uh I think nonprofits and advocacy groups. Um, and the result of that was that they had a labor union, which seems insane, but they really treated their employees terribly. Um, and it predated me, but yeah, we're John Muir Local 100. Uh, I got to do, I think we had 70 members or something, not a big union, uh, but I got to do a, a contract negotiation and uh, it was quite the education. And how old were you at the time? Uh, 24. I don't know. Oh, there were only 70 or 80 of us. Somebody had to do it. It's not that it wasn't a big pool. Let's just put it that way. Okay. So uh, for those of you watching, it should be clear and it's going to become clear that uh, Mike speaks his mind and acts accordingly. Um, Steve, the climateer, your blog, uh, how do you select your topics and then how do you research them? So it right it, it took me a while to articulate that. Um, you know, it was because it was just sort of intuitive. Um, but I think the way I select my topics is when I'm doing all this reading and when somebody's wrong, I want to argue why they're, you know, someone is wrong on the internet. And um I would like to have a well articulated explanation of. Um, you know, of why that is so, or, or, or just, I see a lot of uncertainty, you know, there, there are a lot of topics where, you know, what is the role of nuclear power, you know, how do we, are we, you know, do we have room for all the wind farms and solar panels we're going to need, you know, uh, do electric vehicles really make sense, because you have to mine all the lithium, and all, there's all these questions, you know, some of which I think have clear answers, some of which don't, um, but whether there's a clear answer or not, you'll find people, uh, you know, spouting both, both takes, and, you um, I just kind of wanted to have an opinion that I felt like I could defend on these important questions. So it's when you know it's when I see when I see sort of confusion in the the broad conversation, then that's then I I get motivated to go and dive in. The research is is tricky. You know, it, 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 I find it you know as a lay person, and I suspect this might be true even if I wasn't a lay. You know, my background is in software engineering, but you know, I suspect even if I had you know a PhD in some aspect of client or climate science or something, I'm not sure it would make that much difference. It's really hard to go in and dive in on it. You know, like how much lithium do we really need for the electric cars we're going to build, and how much? You know, we know that has impact on the environment, all that mining, but how much impact and how is that going to play out as we get more sophisticated? And it's very hard to find rigorous answers to these questions. But I think it's some combination of no one knows, you know, science is still in the process of, of figuring these things out. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of bad information out there. And even the good information is not necessarily communicated well. So the research is just kind of Googling, you know, looking for, you know, scientific papers. Um, and, you know, one thing I found important is to try to get half a dozen different sources for anything, because the first three sources I find I will misunderstand you know, in hindsight, having, you know, checked back and so on. Um, you know, every time I find a fourth source on some question, I realize like it will contradict the first three and either one of them is wrong or I've misunderstood one of them, usually both. Um, and so, yeah, it just takes a lot of, if, a lot of digging from as many different kinds of sources um, as, as, yeah, as you can come up with. Have you ever been surprised by uh, what you learned doing your research? Writing the blog? Yes. Um, I'm trying to think whether I can think of interesting examples. Well, I'll, so here, here's one kind of epiphany that, that comes to mind. Um, and I'm trying to 
think how I, how I can explain this quickly. So there's there is a lot of controversy around the question of carbon offsets. And the, the basic idea here is, you know, I'm doing something that emits uh, emits greenhouse gases, but rather than stop doing that, I'm going to pay someone else to do some climate good thing that will balance my climate bad thing. And there's a lot of controversy, you know, does this really happen? You know, if you pay someone to do the good thing, are they really going to do it? Are they really going to preserve that forest? Maybe they were going to preserve the forest anyway. So there's a lot of questions around it in practice. But the more I dug into it, I realized there was a even just a conceptual challenge, which is, so let's say I'm running a coal plant and I'm spewing, you know, I'm burning coal and emitting carbon dioxide. And I find somewhere where someone who owns a patch of forest is planning to lock, cut it down and, and, you know, burn it for, you know, to clear it for farming or something. And I pay them not to do that. And that, and that gives me an offset that I can use to keep running my coal plant. There's a double counting here. You know, running the coal plant is bad. Cutting down the forest is bad. If I, if the coal plant owner pays the forest owner not to cut down the forest, then the coal plant is still running and we're still emitting carbon dioxide. So we basically had one good deed, preserving the forest, is being credited to the forest owner because nobody's going to be mad at them. They're not cutting their forest down and being credited to the coal owner because they paid for it. And, um, and so there's just that, you know, this is just a conceptual problem at the bottom of that whole category of offsets, um, which is not something that I saw coming until I was really trying to, to make sense of it. And yet uh, carbon off, there is a carbon offset market, isn't there? And it's of some size and- uh... Yeah, many and yeah, ver various markets and um, you know, some more rigorous than others. And, and not, all, not all offsets have this, you know, the, the kind of offset I was just describing is, and I realize I'm dragging us down into into the weeds here, but is what's called avoided emissions. Um, you know that forest wasn't there was no carbon emission going on in that forest. There was the worry that it, there would be emission. You know because you know supposedly someone was planning to cut it down, and then we avoid that. We pay to a, a pay to to not cut the the forest down. There's uh, another category of offsets which is based around sequest sequestration. I'm pronouncing that right, where you take some carbon that's in the air and you yank it out of the air, maybe by growing some trees or maybe by running some industrial process that chemically removes the carbon from the air, or there's a variety of ways you can do this. You actually take carbon out of the air and you pull it down. Um, that's a much, 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 much smaller category, but a lot of work is going into it and it's going to be growing in, in the coming years. Um, and that's more legitimate. Um, you still mind that, you know, if you keep running your coal plant, but you're paying someone to remove carbon from the air, you can achieve greenhouse gas neutrality that way. You're still causing a lot of other problems that, you know, coal plants generate particulate pollution and have all other kinds of lots of other bad impacts that you're not compensating for. And by the way, it would never be economic to run a coal plant that way. Um, but it is at least a legitimate way of balance, you know, so negative emissions, pulling carbon out of the air is at least a legitimate way of balancing the, someone's greenhouse impact. Um, but avoided emissions, I think, have a lot more problems. Um, I think that's, we'll come back to sequestration later. I think that um, perhaps that is something that we can talk a little bit more about. But, but first of all, uh, you've become a philanthropist. Uh, and how do you decide what organizations, and we'll just talk about climate change uh, for this discussion, that you support and by extension others should support um yeah it's it's difficult um you know there's a million different activities that are going on under the heading of you know trying to do something about climate change right from you know subsidizing you know you know lower income families to put solar panels on their roofs to you know funding new research research into some new you know industrial process that's more efficient to you know um um, you know, supporting different political candidates. So there's, you know, apples, oranges, bananas, you know, lots of different categories of activity. Some of these organizations may be more or less effective in what they're doing. Um, they may, you know, not honestly need funding, even if they're soliciting funding, or maybe they can really make good use of the funding. And, um, you know, I've, I found it very bewildering to try to, to make sense of all that. And, and I, I've, I've been the whole system seems to be set up to expect philanthropists to figure all this out themselves. 
know, there are a lot of resources out there, but the resources that will try to educate you to the point where you make those decisions yourself as a philanthropist strikes me as a very, you know, questionable system. Um, because, you know, there's sort of this premise that, you know, if you've come into some money, then you, you know, you must be intelligent enough to make good choices and we should support you, you in making the sort of policy decision about, uh, you know, where investment in climate change should go. Um, and, you know, so I, I, I found this very frustrating. And in some sense, kind of what I'm gradually working toward in the blog is trying to, um, since I, you know, I couldn't find the sort of answers I wanted of which organizations are most effective or even which kinds of work would be most important for an organization to be addressing. That's something I'm trying to, to work toward and as, you know, I do my learning. Um, but to get back to your actual question, how, how do I choose organizations to support? Um, it's wound up to some extent just being social proof. You know, if I've met someone who seems like they know what they're talking about and they, they are supporting an organization, then, then I'm inclined to, you know, I give that a lot of weight. Um, I have found a couple of groups that do please, systematic please research. Yeah, I um, mean, the one I'll, the one I'll mention in particular is called Giving Green, um, and uh, yeah, we can post the the address in the chat. Um, but yeah, so this is a group that they actually go out. You know, they look at you know maybe hundreds, definitely dozens of different organizations. And they try to, they have a staff of several people and they try to do, you know, rigorous analysis of, you know, what work is this organization doing? What would the impact be, you know, if they're funding this type of research, what would the effect of that research be? If they're, you know, lobbying for this political action, you know, how, what are the odds that they'll succeed in, in producing the political change and what would the impact of that be? So they really, you know, put in much more legwork than an individual could put in. And, um, and they publish a pretty short list of recommendations. I think there's, it's on the order of half a dozen groups that they recommend, you know, could, you know, really make extremely good, good use of, uh, good use of funds. Uh, no, Amy, uh, make sure that gets into chat. And speaking of chat, uh, I want to reinforce, uh, we want your questions. So put them in chat and hopefully we'll get time to uh, have time to get to them. Um, and you did a blog on this as well, did you not? On uh, philanthropy and, uh, you did so. Uh, <laughs> so when you go to to um, Steve's site, the Climateer, you can look through the past blogs, and there is one on philanthropy. Although you you uh, got the essence of what's in that as well. Uh, I also want to add that uh, locally, the Michigan League of Conservation Voters, which Mike was once on the board when he lived in Ann Arbor, uh, does very good work. And Noemi is going to put the link. Uh, in chat for that organization as well. One of the things that I really like about what they do is that they mobilize voters to vote for candidates who are going to do the right thing. It's more than just asking for your money. It's asking for your time and your influence because, and this will come up more than once in our discussion, I hope, geez, government is important in this. We're not going to solve it without a functioning government with the right values. Mike, do you want to add anything as to what sort of, uh, if one wanted to provide financial support to an organization, anybody you particularly like? Or uh, I, I, that has not been a part of. I, I run a startup, so that has not been something that I've been necessarily is uh, freed up to be able to do still. So uh, I think the Steve offers good advice there. All right, terrific. Well, good luck to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, in the United States, there are more than 80 billion corrugated boxes used every year. And um, what did the founder of Returnity, the organization you're currently the CEO of, uh, how did he think he was going to solve that problem? Well, it, it turns out um, that he lucked into uh, having a customer who was building a really big business himself who asked for it. So he, uh, the original company that Returnity uh, changed into was a reusable shopping bag business, little mom and pop company out of Santa Cruz in California. And it happened to have James Reinhardt, uh, the co-founder and CEO of ThreadUp, which some of you may have heard of. It's publicly traded now. It's a billion dollar company buying and selling used clothing. And James was buying these shopping bags as like giveaways for when they were going to shows. And he asked if we could make him a reasonable shipping bag. And so we said, I don't know, let's try. And we did, and he liked it and he invested. So he really was the initial impetus. Uh, that investor group brought me in 
six years ago almost to kind of take it on, focus just on shipping and delivery packaging um, and see if we couldn't replace it with something reusable and more sustainable. Um, and we've been working that problem ever since. And uh, as far as you know, you're the largest in the field, right? Returnity is. Yeah, I, you know, we're our packaging is being used for millions of shipments a year now, which sounds impressive, and and we're very proud of that. Of course, as you <laughs> highlighted, it is uh, a enormous shipping world, so there's still a lot of work to be done. But uh, the the trend lines have been exciting, and um, and we've we've certainly learned a lot about what it takes to make it a successful alternative to cardboard, which everybody knows and hates, but knows. And so it's it's the it's definitely the incumbent that that uh, we're trying to displace. You have and had lots of competitors, and why collectively uh, are we still getting Amazon boxes piling up? What's the flaw in the concept of returnable, yeah. reusable packaging? You can't make something that lasts more than one shipment. Is that the problem? Well, it's like a lot of environmental issues. It's not. It's a systems problem more than than a product problem. And so, packaging is is a systems challenge. You know, taking something that's linear and making it circular, which is what you know, it was sustainable. Then it was. I I, I I'm forgetting that. You know, the name changes. It's basically the same thing. Now it's called circularity. Um, and making something that's linear circular is not really about the product itself generally. It's about the system in which it operates and can it function in a way that's economically and operationally and environmentally uh, superior to what you're trying to replace. And it turns out uh, with packaging, that's not generally going to be true. Um, we make really great shipping bags and boxes and they last for a long time if they stay in circulation. But that if thing is where a lot of this falls down. Uh, like literally just today wasn't, wasn't planted. Like somebody, uh, sent like forwarded a message on, on LinkedIn to me. Cause somebody, some other person was ranting about this huge box they got for an Amazon delivery and the little product inside. And this is ridiculous. And somebody should do something about this. And that frustration is very real, but in practice, you need to keep reusable packaging and circulation at a very high level, like 90 to 95%. And people just don't follow through with that level it's not important enough in but your daily are, life so what, yeah go ahead def, uh, tell us a little bit more what that means 90 to 95 percent well are, so you know when you make something that's a reusable package whether it's shipping packaging like we focus on or like that refillable shampoo bottle or you know whatever the you know and some some people may have heard of blue land which is getting a lot of uh um, growth now and things like that, where instead of buying the whole thing with the liquid inside for your soap, you buy a little capsule and you put it inside and you fill it with water and do all these things. And now you have your product. Um, all those refill and reuse systems, almost, almost across the board, what they're making is a package that's a lot more material and energy intensive than the single use thing, because it has to last if it's meant to be reusable. So they build something that's really material and energy intensive for the planet the first time, right? Because it's more stuff. But then as you use it, you catch up and actually you create benefit, but you have to use it. And that's where the problem comes in because a lot of people can buy a reusable thing, but that doesn't mean that they then reuse the reusable thing. And so, and the math is like unforgiving. Like, you know, the difference between 75% follow through and 90% follow through. We need to define what those percentages mean. 95% yeah. means it has to be returned on an average of 20 times. Is that right? Well, it, it, it's the inverse. So if, if somebody ships back that package to be used again, 95% of the time, then it will stay in circulation for 20 uses. Because, you know, you send out 100, you get 95 back. You send out 95, you get... 89 back, whatever, you know, the math is. So like you keep getting fewer and fewer back. So like the average number of uses across all of those packages um, goes up or down depending on how often it stays in circulation. So it's almost never a problem that it broke. The problem is somebody threw in their garage or the garbage or the closet or whatever, and it just never got another chance to be used. And um, this is pretty universal, right? These things just never, ever do. They, they only work in very controlled environments. You know, I call, I, I've started referring to them like New, New Year's resolutions. Like it's, you make this resolution that you're going to change your life. You're going to change your behavior. I, this is a better, better for the planet, but 
New Year's resolutions are hard to stick to. Most people don't. And it's the same with a lot of these new ideas around reuse and refill. It sounds obvious, the modern milkman and all these things. In practice, you know, it's just not important enough in people's lives. And I would argue as somebody who works on this stuff that it isn't important enough. Like there are way more important things that we can and need to be doing than trying to really change our behavior around something as small as packaging. The cumulative impact of packaging is, is significant and like any amount of improvement is good. But reuse and packaging, which is obviously what I, you know, what I focus on, has gotten like way out of line with like the hype and excitement around it and, and the actual real implications of all these products and services that are being sold, which just aren't really working and probably are making the problem worse, even if you feel better because you bought the refill thing. And then, oh, yeah, but I didn't get around to refilling so it. So when you give this speech... When you've given this speech at the conferences where people are interested in circularity, is this why you're not getting invited back to speak so many no. times? I, I am getting invited back, but now it's changing a bit. I think, well, look, what, what happened is the economy got crappy or crappier and companies could stop spending money on baloney as much as, as really sustainability. So when it didn't really matter and they could just trot out this, look, we've got this circularity thing. We're, we're doing what we're supposed to. Um, even though it didn't make any sense economically, that was okay because they had a budget for it. Now they don't have a budget for it. So uh, uh, increasingly our viewpoint is, I think, appreciated because we're helping companies avoid making poor choices and by extension, helping consumers avoid making poor choices uh, because these programs don't do what we want them to do. And rather than bemoaning that, we should redirect our energy towards where those do work. And they are working. Like, you know, we have some partners who were working on some projects that their core business is implementing refillable to go containers on campuses for campus cafeterias. It's really a pretty closed environment and they get them back over 95% of the time. It's unquestionably a better uh, solution environmentally. You compare that to like, if you go to you know, Zingerman's and get it in a to-go container, people aren't likely going to return it to Zingerman's often enough because you're, you know, it's it's just much harder to set your lifestyle around that. And those kinds of programs probably are making things worse. So you can find pockets, but you have to be diligent, you have to be focused, and you have to be honest about, you know, is it really making a difference uh, from a sustainability standpoint or not? Uh, tell us a little bit about the New Jersey trial that you're conducting and who you're conducting it for. Yeah. And, this, and so this is a good example of sort of like feel good um, ambitions bumping up against real world implications. So New Jersey banned single use bags for all grocery, both in store and delivery and like across the board, no single use bags anymore, paper or plastic. And uh, so you can buy reusable bags, but you they don't have any other bags there. And um, the problem with that, of course, is that you, as you know, many of the listeners may know, is like you reusable bags have to be reused, like a lot, to be better than that single use bag. Which we all hate. If I have a well, cotton reusable bag, how many times? Yeah, I mean, a cotton bag, I've seen they say a thousand times to replace a single use plastic. Those little thin, you know, um, bags, because you know, you're it's so much more material and you're farming cotton and all the production and all the, all the things for this tiny little plastic bag. Now those tiny plastic bags are terrible for the environment and all the ways we're familiar with and, you know, getting caught in trees and, in, in wetlands and all those, you know, and it's oil. And there's lots of things to not like about those bags, but just saying no more doesn't mean you've fixed it. And so now in New Jersey, they have this problem because people, Look, people like buying food online and having it delivered now. I mean, we got that was happening before the pandemic, and now it's happening a lot more. And you got to give it to them in something. So, what are they giving it to them in? Reusable bags that are like five to 10 times the amount of plastic that the single use bag that they replaced was. How many of those like consumers don't need any more of those bags, but they have to give it to them in something? So, these are the sort of knock on effects that happen from maybe, you know. Ideas that sound good on paper, but in practice, you know, these are the things that you really have to account for, and um, so it's it's a it's it's messy right now. So, uh, how much uh, environmental benefit does it to make things out of used juice packets? Uh, yeah, I mean, somebody out there that does that. 
and similar things. Right. You know, I saw there's a backpack, uh, one of the biggest backpack manufacturers, and they had this really exciting story. They got covered in a lot of the trade press and and the fashion blogs because they they took used bags from their customers and they made they like patched them together to make new bags to sell. How many did they sell? 80. You know, this company probably makes 10 million backpacks a year. They made 80 out of old backpacks and like they were getting all this praise. I'm like, I mean, it's cool. I like the backpack. It looked interesting, but clearly this isn't having an impact. And, you know, there's this company, you know, TerraCycle, which, you know, many of you may have heard of that gets a lot of press and they collect up used juice boxes and, and potato chip bags. But, you know, the, they never ever divert more than a fraction of a percent of what's made from landfills. And so, you know, it's not having any real impact. And they've been doing that for 20 years. You know, you, you have, we have, we, if we're going to be on, we need, you know, the climate is in crisis. We have to be honest about what really works at scale and what doesn't. Those sorts of things feel good. They look cool. They don't have any impact. They don't. So, you know, I, that's where I get frustrated. People need to appreciate, you know, don't sweat the small stuff. Do the small stuff if you're inclined and you're, and you're motivated. You should. But the small stuff is not going to get us there. And recycling juice boxes, uh, you know, a few more juice boxes is not going to solve our climate crisis. Uh, so, so that people stick with us. I'm going to not disclose what will until later. Uh, the favorite story you've told me, my favorite story that you've told me recently is about uh, making compost out of your garbage. You want to describe that one to us? Uh, yeah, I mean... There, I mean, the problem is that if people, yeah, there's a company that there's a lot, actually a number of companies now that sell home, you know, various tools for you to compost at home. Um, and, and then they're sort of increasingly sophisticated and, and can involve you mailing back your compost to them so that they can turn it into chicken feed and things like that. And, you know, on the margins, great. But the problem here is again, on the margins, like, it sort of it sort of fits around this idea of like um, conscientious consumption. Like, well, I buy things this way today, but if I buy the greener thing, then I've solved the climate crisis and I feel good about myself. But what that ends up doing is often just having people buy more stuff, which is not helpful, or like buy things that they don't need or end up using, which I suspect is what it's about to happen with some of these convenient composting solutions. Um, if you already have it, you know, lots of communities have composting in their city where you literally put it out on the on the curbside and most people don't do it. If they're not going to do that thing, which is the easiest thing that can be done, then they're not going to buy a machine and do it consistently at home. It's just it's a distraction. What money did they raise? A um, hundred million or something like that. I mean, yeah, right. including some of your brothers. Inadvertently, but uh, and indirectly, indirectly. Yeah, yeah. Ixne and, and the Unding Fee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not to everyone's good, you know, not through my choice, but just as something indirectly I, I was invested in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, Steve, if one had the means, and Mike, then I want you to chime in too. What can one do to make uh, more meaningful contribution than um, using a cotton grocery bag. Um, so I, I've, I've never done a real like analysis of this and I would like to, and it's something I'm going to get to on the blog, but, you know, just based on my understanding the, you know, and, you know, just aside from straight out philanthropy, the things you can do in as an individual, you know, first of all, there's two very important purchasing decisions. Whenever you're buying a new car, if it's practical for you, electric, like we need to replace all the internal combustion cars with electric cars and that makes a big difference. Uh, and the other is your home heating, um, you know, instead of a furnace, put in a heat pump. Again, you know, these purchases only make sense at certain time, you know, if your old furnace is wearing out or whatever, but when you're actually at the decision point, electric cars and heat pumps, and, um, and I think you can also get heat pump water heaters, like that makes a real difference. Um, to Mike's point about, you know, New Year's resolutions, like if you buy an electric car, you have an electric car, you're not going to be driving the car you don't own anymore. So, you know, it's not, it doesn't have that New Year's resolution problem where you have to keep sticking to the decision. Once you've made the purchase, you've made the purchase and that's your car or that's your home heating solution. Um, 
So those, you know, those are decisions you can make. You don't have to worry whether you're going to stick to it. Um, they're pretty economical at this point. The details depend a lot on your exact circumstance, but um, you're not necessarily making any sacrifice for it. And they have other nice benefits. You know, you don't get as much pollution in your home. The car is not as noisy and so on. Um, and uh, that makes a real difference. And then the the other big lever is actually political. Um, and there's a lot of angles to this. So, you know, trying to, you know, drag an entire district from, you know, Democratic to Republican for a senator or, or, or congressperson or something like, you know, that's its own, own whole issue. But that like, that's not a high leverage way to help the environment because it's so hard to, you know, do, you know, make your contribution toward flipping a district. There's a lot of other reasons you might want to do that. But there's a lot of smaller, less polarized, less hard fought political decisions that have real impact on the climate. And this may be, and I don't know the details for Ann Arbor, and I wish I did, but um, this may be, you know, who's being elected to some county board or, you know, municipal power regulation. Let me give you, let me give you a live example that I read about today in the paper. But first of all, I want to plug for myself. In 2011, I bought the first electric car sold in Michigan, and I love it, as my family knows, and about anybody else who met me knows. Love it. Um, Augusta Township, I read today, their planning commission or whatever uh, turned down a request to install a 500 acre solar panel facility because it would change the nature of the community. Um, now, Apparently that was overruled in the uh, in the large whatever the larger entity is, but not without considerable opposition from some of the members of that. So that's a real live current here in Washtenaw County example. Exit. Yeah, it's a perfect example, and this happens all the time. There'll be some you know relatively obscure county board or whatever. And they're going to make a decision on a billion dollar coal plant. You know, do, do we keep running it or do we shut it down or, or yeah, permitting a major wind or solar project and, and so forth. Um, and so, you know, I actually to, to I, I support two organizations. Uh, I give money to two organizations that seek out these high leverage, small scale campaigns and, and try to steer support to the right candidates. Um, one's called climate cabinet and the other is the down ballot climate project um and they they specifically seek out these 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 kinds of high leverage candidates um but you know there may be things like this going on you know around ann arbor or wherever or wherever you live um and also something i don't know a lot about but i hear stated over and over again is you know a lot of these decisions involve public hearings and public comment periods and so forth and just no one goes except maybe a paid representative for the local electric utility or something um, and so just individual, you know, this is, uh, and it, you know, a lot of these hearings and, and decision processes are situations where, you know, one voice from one private citizen can actually, you know, nudge, nudge things noticeably. If anybody out there wants to organize to do this, uh, I'm in. I can provide support for that guidance and whatever. So if, uh, to reiterate, if you're interested in being a lobbying group for saving the planet locally, let me know and we'll do something. Okay. Uh, Mike, anything you want to add to this as to what folks can do? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, just to sort of reinforce that, you know, ultimately, our, it's no secret that our society has not um, exactly had the most united, well functioning democracy for a little while now. And so, but there's a lot of people who care a lot about issues like climate, and a lot of companies are reflecting that concern, and they're trying to take action. And I think what has happened is that consumers and citizens have started to think that, like, well, companies got us in this mess because they make stuff that pollutes, and companies are trying to fix it. So, like, companies are going to fix it. And companies are doing, you know, the private sector is doing a lot to make it worse and a lot to help make it better. Those things are certainly true. But this is not a, as I sort of said before, this is not a we're going to buy ourselves, we're not going to buy stuff conscientiously as a as the solution to climate. Like this is a society level problem. It needs society level actions. It needs societies pushing and setting the, the regulations. And if we don't have a well-functioning government and a, and a civil society that is empowered to direct these problems, 
then yeah, I mean, Patagonia can make really cool jackets that have relatively light impact and that's great, but we're still gonna have a climate problem. Like we have to have a functioning society that's built upon democratic action if we're gonna do this. And so that's why like it, it feels it feels easier because it is to buy the thing that has more, more recycled content and you should do that if you can. But the thing that really is gonna matter are the big levers like buying electric cars or pushing government to represent us and and our and our in our country in a way that actually solves the problem at the systemic level. Um, none of you have mentioned some of the big uh, personal items that cause emission, like air travel, like having one small home, whatever. Uh, is the reason is that's just not realistic. People aren't going to do it no matter how well-meaning they are. I, I think so. I mean, I would answer two parts of it. So the short answer is, yeah. Um, you know, there, you know, there's some, some people who do and, you know, and that's great. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's realistic to expect people to volu voluntarily make, you know, real sacrifices. Like, you know, if, if, if you're someone who travels and you're being asked not to, like, that's a, it's going to be a, you know, big, you know, significant sacrifice you'd be making, you know, buying a smaller house than you were otherwise inclined and so forth. Um, you know, those things definitely help, you know, be, make a huge difference, but I don't, I don't think it's realistic. And furthermore, there's a, a, a school of thought that I've, I've been reading and, and really resonates with me, which is that it, it's just bad messaging. And, you know, kind of going all the way back to the 70s, there's been this connection that, you know, protecting the environment, you know, even before it was about greenhouse gases, when it was about, you know, other aspects of, uh, you know, of the environment and ecology, there's been this association that the way you protect the environment is you sacrifice, you put on a sweater, you turn down, uh, you know, your, your furnace, your air conditioner, um, you drive less, you do all these things. And, and it's true, those things help, but it's, it's not a message that most people get excited about. And it, it, and it, creates the idea that the only what the only solutions involve sacrifice and what's emerged in recent years and I and I can't quite tell whether this is just luck or there's a fundamental reason behind it but we're finding more and more solutions that don't really involve sacrifice you know people are buying electric cars because you know to your point like electric cars are awesome they're, you know, they're, they're, they've been very expensive and we're getting out of that, but they're, they have great pickup. They, you know, you don't have to go to the gas station. They're quiet. They're, you know, like electric cars are, are great. And, um, and we're finding more and more and more green solutions that, that don't really involve sacrifice. Now it's complicated and, you, you know, there's other environmental impacts, you know, we're mining lithium and, and cobalt and nickel in ways that have a lot of problems. And that, you know, it, it, these are not panaceas, but uh, but but they are honest to God paths to you know significantly improve the, the greenhouse gas the climate situation without asking consumers to make what they will consider a sacrifice and I think by you know and again the the argument that gets made that resonates with me is if we can reorient the messaging and the conversation on climate not as well like let's all do our part and sacrifice but Imagine, you know, look at how awesome it's going to be when you've got, you know, the, the electric car that goes zero to 60 before you push the accelerator and you've got the induction burner that boils your pot of water in three seconds and everything like, oh, and by the way, it's better for the environment. Um, you know, that feels like the politically, societally, you know, path forward that that's more achievable. So are you optimistic? Uh, about sort of what's going to happen to the planet? Yeah, we're going to so survive. Well, well. If we don't blow ourselves up, uh, yeah. uh, so we're going to be able to mitigate the environmental damage enough to uh, survive, at least environmentally. I mean, survive. Yes, yeah, so it depends a little bit on where you live. Um, you know, talk to some, you know, a lot of people in Pakistan after the flooding last year, for example. You know, big picture, I do believe we're going to get warming under control. I believe we're going to get to at least close to and probably all the way to zero net greenhouse emissions, we're going to bring warming under control. It's going to take a lot longer than we would wish. There's a lot of, a lot of, you know, suffering is going to happen along the way. Um, you know, the, the climate we had in 2022 
Um, big picture sucked. It's the best climate any of us are going to see for the rest of our lives. Give you know, give or take a, a wiggle or two in the next couple of years. Um, you know, it's not it's, it's not going to you know as we bring emissions under control, it's not going to make things better. It's just going to stop it from getting further worse. Um, but we are going to get there, and you know, I do believe we're going to get there, and I can believe we're going to get there. At, you know, at a point that is not going to be broadly catastrophic for, you know, the, the world overall. There's going to be a lot of localized problems. There's going to be fires. There's going to be floods. There are going to be regions that, you know, low-lying islands and so forth that really, so, so there's going to be problems, but this is not the end of the world. It's not the end of civilization or society. Um, you know, we, we, we are going to get there. And the reason we're going to, the reason I believe that is not because I think think that, you know, as a society and a planet, we're going to collectively pull all of our heads out of our rears. Um, there's a little or bit of that. Somebody going else's. <laughs> yeah, or somebody else's. I believe it because solar power is getting so cheap and electric cars are getting cheaper. And like these, all these green solutions are coming, you know, these new technologies and product designs and so forth are coming roaring onto the playing field. And they're just going to kick uh, coal power and internal combustion engines and a lot of these other things out of the way because they're better and cheaper. I I wish I understood why that is, why in category after category after category we're seeing that. It might just be because a lot of really motivated people are really trying, or there might be some more fundamental scientific reason about electricity is just better than chemical energy in some deep way, but it seems to be what's happening. There's going to be a lot, a lot of exceptions, a lot of you know things that you know take longer than they should. But I, I think that's the trend. I just hope we don't have to send Elon Musk a thank you note. That that's something I can't tolerate. <laughs> Mike, are you optimistic? Well, yeah. I mean, I would reinforce. Yes, I'm optimistic about the technology part. Um, you know, I think that the political and uh, human side of it is going to be really challenging. Um, and I mean, Steve mentioned like what happened in Pakistan, you know, the, and to come back to what I was saying before, like, if you don't have a strong society that's ready to, uh, assist in all the small, uh, the localized, but significant disruptions to people's lives. I mean, you know, probably everyone is familiar with the sort of a part of the climate crisis, which people are anticipating we're already seeing, which is migration, Right. Um, you know, certain parts of the planet are just not going to be uh, hospitable anymore to, to human uh, life. And so people are going to move around. We're not doing a good job with that today. And if we're going to have a lot more of it tomorrow, what's that going to look like? So, you know, I think we can solve a lot of the problems of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions through technology. And we are doing that at an increasingly rate, increasing rate, but we need to have strong societies to absorb all this shock and change that's that's already happening and will only accelerate. That's where I'm more worried. You're welcome. Uh, as a witness who's behind me here can attest, uh, I've gotten through two pages or on my second page of things that I want to talk about out of seven. Uh, so uh, I don't have a shortage of, of questions, but uh, no, Amy, what do we have in chat? I want to make sure people have had their questions answered, or if not, uh, we can answer as many of them as possible. Okay, and I know Mike and uh, Steve, you're looking at the chat too, but let's see, at 8.03, I was trying to put the times where I should look when people, uh, so... Uh, can you talk about electric cars and hybrids versus electrical? Electric, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, so I'm, I'm not a, I, I don't have any deep expertise here. Uh, yeah, I think the short answer is electric is best, hybrid is second best. Um, you know, there's a lot of concerns about the materials we have, you know, the lithium and the other mining, you know, what if you're charging off of a coal plant and so on? Um, I, you know, those are all factors, but I still think, you know, buy an electric if you can, but otherwise buy a hybrid. Um, one thing to think about is, like, the project isn't really to reduce emissions today. It's to set ourselves up to super reduce emissions over the coming 20, 30 years. And a lot of what we're doing right now is, you know, you know, you know, some fraction of, of the car market was electrics and it was a bigger fraction. And now in the US, it's like five point something percent. Next year is going to be 10 percent. So what we're doing right now isn't really replacing the cars. We are scaling up 
Tesla and now, you know, GM and Ford and all the other companies, you know, as they develop their products and build their scale their manufacturing and get more efficient, we're climbing those curves where a few years from now, everything is electric cars. So it, you know, it's really, you know, we need to be looking to where we want to be in the coming decades rather than where we are today. And in those coming decades, you're not going to be charging, even if you're charging your electric car off a coal plant today, over the lifetime of that car, the energy you're putting into it is going to get pretty clean. So you, you don't want to be buying the new uh, new electric car or the new gas car today. Has anyone looked into the cost of carbon capture devices like the one reported by the U of Delaware in February? Um, yeah, so again, and, and by the you know, Mike, feel free to jump in, but um, there's many different solutions, you know, lots of different categories and types and approaches to carbon capture being worked on. The number I see talked about a lot is that people kind of expect costs to come down to something like $100 per ton, $100 per ton of carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere. Um, that it's for a lot of the things we do that emit carbon, it will probably be better and cheaper to stop doing the emitting thing instead of to keep doing it and then pay someone to pull the carbon back out. So, you know, rather than buying a gas car and then paying, you know, and then purchasing some carbon removal, you should just buy an electric car. Um, but there are some, be some places where we can't do that, you know, jet travel, air, air travel, you know, we're not going to make electric planes that, that go any distance. So, you know, the way to look at it, I think, is, is it cheaper to halt the emission or is it cheaper to purchase the carbon removal that may settle in at something like $100 a ton? And usually it's going to be cheaper to halt the emission, but sometimes we're going to need to, to do the other thing. And by the way, we can also use those negative emissions technologies to gradually, gradually start to roll back the historical damage to pull back some of our historical emissions. What, what would it be like if we had just abundant, cheap, green energy? What could we do with that? Well, I, I mean, just to sort of connect the, what Steve was just saying to that question is that, I mean, some of you may have seen in the last month, there was this sort of, holy crap, the cost of electric cars um, is basically a parity with gas cars this year. And nobody thought that was going to happen for at least five more years. So it's sort of like part of the answer to that is to say, and Steve, this sort of connects to what you said up front, like the experts, like this is not straightforward and simple, right? And things are happening in real time and lots of, you know, so many different stakeholders and players and people making changes in policies. And, you know, what if the infrastructure bill that was really a climate bill didn't pass last year by Biden and what like, so it's all happening very quickly because it's turns out it's a whole big planet of interconnected, uh, difficult systems to try and track and understand. So, you know, I think the answer to that is that a lot can happen with it. A lot will happen with it. And we don't know how quick we'll get there and exactly what the impact will be other than to say like, the trend lines on the tech side keep happening better, faster, more than people thought even like two years ago. So the benefits will in, you know, should in parallel be better, more and faster as well. However, all those things interconnect. Yeah. I, I, I'll just add one detail. You know, there's, there's a lot of interesting discussion about exactly that. And what would we do with, with abundant clean energy? And I, I do think we're going to have abundant clean energy, at least if we can get out of our own way with all the permitting and so forth. But um, I'll throw out one example, which is desalination, uh, you know, turning seawater into fresh water. The, I, I've only glanced at this, but you know, people who I respect keep saying that we may enter, we may get to the point where it's, it's just cheap, you know, stop pumping the rivers dry, stop killing the fish, stop, like we don't even need to fight over the water. It's gonna be so cheap to just desalinate that it's really going to change the water. And, you know, that's a, and water scarcity and competition for water resources, of course, is a huge issue in lots of the planet. Now, yeah, you know, I'm glossing over 100 things. Like there, there are some environmental issues with desalination. Uh, you have to be near an ocean in order to do it. There's, you know, there's a lot of other issues. So, I, you know, I don't want to over, you know, I don't want to be glib about it. But in a lot of situations, I, you know, I, I think that's something that's out there on the horizon that no one's really has on their radar yet that's, that's going to be a big game changer. Just as one example of, of, of effective, clean, cheap, clean energy. So somebody is asking about electric cars. What in, impact does lithium mining have on environment? What is the longevity of the electric battery? How are electric batteries disposed after their end of efficiency? 
I want to point out, as I did earlier, my electric car is 12 years old. Okay, same, and I don't have, I haven't replaced the batteries, so. How many miles? Uh, about 80,000. Okay. Uh, as you know, uh, it gets snowy here and uh, I live up a hill and my electric car is two wheel drive and much of the year I need four wheel drive, so. So another funny thing is how do you re recharge your electric car when DTE electric grid goes down for five days? <laughs> well, that never happened. You know, they have a very reliable system here. And they came sure. through. In Michigan, they, especially. They cut down a lot of branches uh, in our backyard, uh, really hacked at them and uh, did a lot of damage. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> Yeah, as far as the, you know, the, with the questions around lithium, um, again, I only have a very shallow knowledge of this. I mean, yeah, there's real environmental impacts and, and you know, some of these other minerals, social impact, you know, child labor and mining. So like, there's problems. They're not as bad as cooking the planet. Um, you know, more, more people will be better off, you know, more, you know, people in underdeveloped countries will be better off if we get emissions under control. Um, does that mean we ignore the, the problems with lithium? No. Um, you know, there's, you know, there's many problems in the world and there's many things we need to to try to address um, and, you know, impacts of lithium mining and, and some of the other minerals used in, you know, in the electric transition are part of that. Um, you know, I don't think it means we don't press forward. It's just, you know, more entries on the long list of things we need to try to do something about. There's a lot of talk of recycling, re either reusing those, basically, you know, once we've mined that lithium and that nickel and that cobalt, there's a lot of work going on to make sure that we keep making use of it forever. So, you know, the battery may last a long time. Um, you know, Dad, you know, you were looking at this many years ago of, you know, once- 15 years ago, I wrote a business plan on, on rebuilding electric car battery packs, reusing them, whatever. And I concluded that it would be too long before enough used batteries became available to make it up appropriate for me. And now that does take place there. That's a, just at the beginning of that industry. Yeah. So when, a, when the battery is not good enough for a car anymore, it might go into something like a school bus that's less demanding. And then when it's not good enough for the school bus, it might wind up as a you know, battery backup in, in someone's ho house or in some industrial facility. And when it's not good enough for that, it'll get, there's already companies working on recycling the nickel and the cobalt. My understanding is it's harder to recycle than the lithium, but I imagine we'll get there. Um, bear in mind that all that reuse and recycling, that only really becomes help, like as we make more and more and more electric cars, as we shift everything over, like we need new lithium for all the new cars. Once we get to steady state where all the cars are lithium and are, are electric, and now we just need to maintain the fleet that we have, that's where the recycling, you know, at that point, we, you know, the amount of mining we need to do, that's when that will really drop and off. And there are alternative battery chemistries that are being looked at that don't involve lithium. So who, who knows what the future is going to bring? Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Somebody is very concerned of what we're going to do with the amounts of salt when we desalinate. How do you say desalinate? Desalinate. So my understanding is, is you don't wind up with a mound of salt. You take salt water and you make fresh water and even saltier water brine and you dump the brine back into the ocean and that's not the best thing to do and that is a negative effect of of the process um and that's about as much as i know about that and somebody's suggesting limit population growth and many of the problems will go away i'm not so sure about that <laughs> well it seems to be happening on its own you know Fertility rates are, you know, for, for better or for worse and for whatever reasons are, are mostly going down in, in more and more and more of the globe. And then there's an interesting little point here. We just returned from Luxembourg where they have echo boxes. These are given to participating restaurants and then customers pay five euros to bring home their own leftovers. You get your five euros back when you return the echo box with, with the, which the restaurant can then reuse. The incentive is you get your money back. Seems like a lot, and it's a lot of money five five bucks for a you know, but. So, and I saw there were some other questions asking about deposits, schemes, and things like that. And obviously, in Michigan, um, you have the ten cent bottle bill and everything. Um, we don't have enough time to go into it now, I suspect, but I'm happy to talk to you at length. Um, those programs don't work. I'm sorry. They don't. They might work for you. You might be the good actor who returns it. But the thing about reuse is that all your neighbors have to do it too. They, all of them, and they don't. And so 
because you think it's obvious and you know you're going to do it does not mean it works. It has to work broad brush. They don't. So is that a I country think, where it works? No. Like in Japan, I know examples. they do like Germany, a Germany has had like standardized glass bottles for beer and they've had this whole infrastructure and it, it goes back 100 years and it works basically across Germany because they've been doing it for 100 years. So that's fine. If we want to invest in that for the next 100 years in the U.S., to the point where we get to where, it's, but that's what it would take. And I look, I mean, you said it up front, like I don't always get popular, the popularity vote when I say this stuff, but this is just the truth. It's just the way it works is that it feels good. It isn't actually doing good. And that's because of the way the math works on reuse. Reuse is its own thing. If you, and, and it just doesn't happen in that way in the real world. I mean, we, have, we know companies who are doing reusable shipping packaging and they get 10 or 20% of them back. They're making these plastic boxes. You go to their website and it's all the great things they're doing for the planet. They're replacing a, a cardboard box with a big piece of plastic that gets thrown away. It's way worse. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm very intimately familiar with the, the motivation and why people want it to work. Uh, you know, It'd be easier for everybody if it did, it doesn't. Tell the reseller employee story. Yeah, I mean, we had... How many at our peak, what, 400,000 phones a month coming through our facility? And we would have employees who would come in every day. It's like, oh, my aunt gave me that phone to recycle and I forgot it home. And then they come back to work the next day. I, I can't believe it. I forgot that phone again. And, and it's like they literally worked at the plant that handled more used phones <laughs> than anywhere in the world. And they couldn't remember because did it make them a bad purpose? And of course not. It's just. It is not that important in our lives. It, it isn't, and it won't be, and, and arguably shouldn't be, right? We have bigger things that we should be directing our energy and emotion towards that are gonna have way more impact than whether or not you return that eco box. If you're inclined to return the eco box, please do that. But don't think that returning eco boxes is where you should be like directing your energy and, and, and comparatively to, to all these other things. Can you comment on nuclear energy? Yeah, we're going to have um, an after this. So, yeah. So, you know, I, you know, the, there's a lot of traditional worries about nuclear energy, about you know, kind of the dangers of it, which I think are overblown. So, you know, I think it would be fine if we were generating a lot more of our electricity from nuclear power. It would make a lot of things easier in the in the energy transition. I don't think it will happen to a significant. I mean, it'll happen a little bit, but I don't think it'll happen significantly. Um, and the main reason is just cost. These things are. So so expensive, so expensive. And now they're competing with cheap, they're gonna, they're gonna be competing with cheap wind and solar, and it's just hopeless. Um, and it gets even worse because you know, nuclear, nuclear power plant is super expensive to build, and then you make your run, money by running it forever, and you don't really have to pay much for fuel. But nobody's gonna want to run it forever, or nobody's gonna want to run it continuously because during most of the day and most of the week, you can't compete on price for the the solar power is free when the sun is shining. So that instead of being able to run 24-7, 365 days a year and sell its power around the clock, now the nuclear plants are only going to be able to economically sell their power at night when the wind isn't blowing and everything else lines up. Just makes the, the economics too hard. All right. One last question, Noemi. Oh, I thought that was the last one. I oh. All right, let's make it the last one because we're over time and there's no reason I should uh, violate my principles of one hour <laughs> uh, just for this. And uh, I want to thank you, Steve, you, Mike. Uh, uh, you have demonstrated to your parents that you were not selected because of nepotism, but because you have interesting things to say about what we can do to save the climate. I also want to acknowledge that our daughters, Shana and Rachel, are also environmental warriors in their own way and make a contribution. Our next show, is, and my guest is going to be Lauren Jasinski, uh, who was a teacher at Oxford High School uh, when the massacre occurred, uh, and, uh, and one of her students, one of the students as well. So that's in two weeks now. And they're going to talk about an organization that they have founded, No Future Without Today. Uh, and uh, Lauren is quite active in seeing that we have gun safety legislation enacted in Michigan. And in two weeks, we hope to be far along on that. And she'll talk to us about that as well. So thank you all.
Um, I certainly enjoyed it. And um, subscribe to Climateer and you'll, you'll get a lot of your questions answered there. And uh, if you want to check out Returnity, um, you can see all the good work that they're doing as well. So thank you all. Thank and you. Now you can go watch the Oscars if you are so inclined. Okay. <laughs> good night. <laughs>